Hey, this video is about how to install a Switch Pros SP9100 in a 2014 Toyota Tundra. This should apply to any third gen Tundras, be very similar for Sequoias. And the way that I've mounted this thing and the general install instructions will probably apply to Tacomas and almost any other vehicle you're gonna put this into. I'm gonna talk for a little bit about why I went with the Switch Pros versus the other options that are on the market. But if you wanna get straight to the install video, skip ahead to this time right here. Before I get into the install, I wanted to talk for a second about why I went with the Switch Pros unit. There are some other options out there on the market, the S-Pod being the main competitor. I think the S-Pod and the Switch Pros are both high quality units and you're probably not gonna be bummed if you go with either of them. I do think Switch Pros is a little bit better. There are some other options out there on the market, but a lot of them are a whole lot cheaper. They're made in China and I think you kinda get what you pay for. The main difference between the Switch Pros and the S-Pod is that the Switch Pros is a solid state design. I don't claim to understand exactly how all the electronics works, but basically all of the fuses, all of the relays, all of the stuff that helps control your accessories and tell your accessories when to turn on and off and also protect the accessories from the vehicle and vice versa, all of that is built into the Switch Pros unit itself. The S-Pod has stuff like relays that are exposed, that can fail, that need to be replaced, um, that are inside the unit that you can see, that you can access. Um, the other big thing is that with S-Pod, it basically comes with two different terminal or bus bars. There's one where you connect the positive wire from your accessory and one where you connect the negative wire. Those are all built into the unit, so you have to run both the negative and the positive from each accessory back to the S-Pod unit itself. With the Switch Pros, um, you don't have any of that. They recommend that you directly solder and seal um, each of those wires um, directly to the wires that are coming out of the 16 pin connector. But by doing this, by soldering and sealing, it makes this entire system totally waterproof and totally weatherproof. Um, there's no exposed metal at all, which really reduces the chances for corrosion. If you're in a place like me in the Pacific Northwest, it's wet around here, there's a lot of mud, there's a lot of water, there's a lot of moisture in the air, and any exposed metal is susceptible to corrosion. If you lived in a different part of the country in a really dry environment, maybe it's not that big of a deal for you. But for me, having all those connections with my lights, my air compressor, inverter, whatever else you're running off this thing, um, making sure that those connections are, are as robust as possible and protected as much as possible is really important to me. However, what was so confusing about all this stuff when I was doing research is I was seeing people install the Switch Pros incorrectly. So I'd see people buy a Switch Pros unit and then I'd see them buy an external bus bar for their positive connections. I'd see them buy another bus bar for their negative connections. I'd see people add uh, extra relays, extra isolation switches, all sorts of stuff that is completely unnecessary. So if you've been digging around on the forums, you've probably seen people install this stuff and in the Tundras and probably other vehicles as well, a lot of folks will start to mount this stuff on top of the fuse box cover. So they'd mount the Switch Pro's power module to the top of the fuse box cover. They'd have one or two different bus bars on it. They'd maybe have an extra relay or an isolation switch and it's starting to get pretty cluttered. And also good luck if you ever need to actually replace a fuse because you have so many wires running on and off your fuse box cover, it's really hard to access it. Not to mention that this actually voids the warranty on your Switch Pros. They recommend that you do not install the power module horizontally. Even though it is totally sealed and weatherproof, if water can pool in some of those connection points, it can corrode those points over time. So they suggest that you mount it vertically. Also, all those terminal bus bars and extra connection pieces, they aren't needed, and they kind of compromise the whole point of the Switch Pros unit in the first place, which is having it sealed, having it solid state, having everything protected from the elements. As soon as you introduce exposed metal, extra parts, uh, screws or connection points that can come loose, uh, you're kind of defeating the whole purpose of the thing, and you might as well just go with the S-Pod. Uh, the beauty of the Switch Pros is that you can take the positive wire from each of your accessories and connect it directly to the wires coming out of the 16 pin connector. At the end of this video, I'll show you how to connect accessories properly. I suggest you learn how to solder. It's not very hard. Anybody can pick up a basic kit 
and get right to it, especially with these simple types of connections. So that was really confusing, seeing all these people install this stuff with all this unnecessary um, other components. And I didn't wanna to have to buy the Switch Pros unit plus all this other shit. Like I just wanted to buy one unit, which is why initially the S-Pod kinda of looked um, more appealing because I didn't have to deal with that. But turns out if you actually read the instructions for the Switch Pros unit, you install the way they recommend it, it's actually very simple and it's very clean when you're all done. And right now, my engine bay looks super clean. Unless you were looking for the Switch Pros unit, you probably wouldn't even know it was there. So, the one hesitancy that I had with going with the Switch Pros unit is the mounting location of the Switch controller itself. If you're like me, you're probably running off-road lights, and of course you're only using them off-road. But if you were to use them in an on-road setting, say like middle of the night, you're driving a mountain pass, you're coming around a corner, and you need to turn off your light bar really quickly. I want to be able to access those switches quickly, fast, and maybe I don't even have to spend a whole lot of time looking at which button I'm pressing. I want to be able to get to them immediately. The S-Pod has um, a nice mounting option where they actually replace the sunglasses holder in the Toyota Tundras. They have rocker switches, which are pretty tactile. It's easy to feel if they're on or off. Uh, the Switch Pros unit for the SP9100 doesn't have that option available yet. Nobody's made a good mounting location for it uh, in the sunglasses holder or really anywhere else in the dash. In my Tundra, I have the bench seat up front, which means that my shifter is on the steering column. If you don't have the bench seat up front, then it means your shifter is down in the middle between those two front seats. If that's the case, then SDHQ actually makes a replacement trim piece where you can mount that switch panel down next to your shifter. It looks really stock and it's super clean, but the problem I have with it is that if you wanna see which button you're pressing, you gotta take your eyes off the road. And for me, I wanna have, want have something that's within my field of view. I don't like looking down and taking my eyes off the road to do it. So what I found with a little bit of research is another mounting possibility that um, really opens up a broad range of places where you can put the switch controller. A company called 67 Designs makes some aftermarket mounting solutions. Um, and I'm gonna show you what I got from them and I'm actually really happy with it. It's mounted on the A-pillar, it's easy to get to, it's easy to see, it's easy to touch. And the way that it's mounted, it doesn't reflect off of any of the windows in, at night when the switch panel is backlit. All right, so basically that's it. That's my thoughts on why the Switch Pros is the best. I've been running it for, I, I actually installed this thing a couple of months ago. I've been running it for a while now and I couldn't be happier. It's awesome, totally psyched with it. All right, to the install. So first of all, I'm just super impressed with this whole Switch Pros kit that I got from SDHQ. Um, here's the power module unit itself and then of course the controller pad. This is the wiring harness that'll plug directly into the unit and then all of these will go to your accessories. Uh, this is the wiring harness that'll go to the controller inside the vehicle and then your connection to the positive battery terminal. Switch Pros also includes a bunch of extra stuff. So there's all the mounting hardware you need. They throw in zip ties. There's a bunch of butt terminals in here. There's uh, T-splice terminals. There's even a fuse at a circuit. So super impressive. They just throw all the stuff in here. Um, for basically whatever you might need. They also include some plastic loom and some woven loom, all sorts of stuff to help protect and just do this wiring properly. So that's awesome. Here's the mount from SDSQ, which is great because they actually um, put the right size nut that you need for the threads, uh, for the bolts that'll mount the power module to this bracket. So super well-made, awesome. Comes with the mounting hardware and then of course, all your stickers. The Switch Pros unit, the SP9100, also comes with this mounting plate, which you could use if you weren't going to use this one, so we don't need it for this install. Here's what I got from 67 Designs. So this is their carbon fiber mount for the Switch Pros controller. This just mounts up directly to the back of this thing. Comes with a little ball, and then I got an attachment arm. This is the smallest one they make, which is the Nano, I believe. Um, and that'll allow me to attach to this piece, which is what they call the A-pillar ball mount for Toyota Tacomas, um, but it actually works for the Tundra 
and it probably works on almost any car where you can access the A-pillar trim. The Switch Pro's controller comes with these studs, so you'll just screw these th studs into the threaded holes on the back of the controller, and then there's nuts to affix it to the back of the mounting plate. With everything all mounted up and connected together, it's pretty slick. And this control arm has like an insane amount of adjustability. So uh, with the two balls on either end and then the swivel in the middle, it's really easy to position this thing however you want it. These screws kind of stick out a little bit long on the backside. You could trim them off, but um, they won't really be visible to the driver or the passenger. So I'll probably just leave them like that for now. To take the A-pillar trim piece out, you're gonna have to remove this little piece right here, which is kind of hard to do because uh, it has a very tight fit around it. I very carefully used a razor blade and snuck it behind this piece in the top left corner and it folds out to reveal this 10 millimeter bolt. When I was still in the truck, I took this whole mounting arm with the piece on it and kind of held it up to the A pillar and tried to position it as best I could for where I actually wanted it to sit. I put a piece of tape over the plastic here and then marked where I'm going to drill to actually mount the controller itself and then I put a little mark here which is I think where I'm going to route the wires to sneak inside and then down through the A-pillar. So I just drilled a hole in here. I'm going to increase the size of that hole and then I might have to do a little bit of Dremel work so I can fit some washers on the back here without these ribs interfering. All right, cut the hole, Dremeled out a little bit of that fin, stacked a couple washers on there and just put a big fat one on to provide a little bit more support. And then you'll have to find yourself a locking nut that fits that bolt because it's not included in the kit. But then on the front of this pillar, uh, it looks like this. So I'm pretty happy with how that turned out and I think it'll work really well. All right, to then run the wires inside the A-pillar trim, what I did is I found myself one of these rubber uh, gaskets here. And this one is a 31, 30 seconds out, outside diameter by a half inch inside diameter which seems to work pretty well it means you can get the hole big enough that you can actually like fit this clip through but then it's not so big that when this grommet is on the outside of this cable it doesn't look huge so I measured it out cut this hole if you don't have one of these drill bits i suggest getting one because it's perfect for something like that boom and there she is nice and clean looking and that's what the inside looks like all right, before we go plugging any of these wiring harnesses in, it is helpful to de-pin this side. This is the Molex connector that's intended to be de-pinned. Uh, it'll help you pass these wires through the firewall a whole lot easier. So this, there are some instructions that kind of give the general outline, but basically you want to have a small screwdriver and you can stick it in this little spot right here in this white piece of plastic and lever it forward. So this is it in the disengaged position. It doesn't actually move a whole lot. And then you gotta have some kind of tool to stick it in this bottom hole and disengage the barb that's on these little bastards. I tried a whole bunch of different things and it seems to really come down to just a matter of millimeters with this. I tried a safety pin for a little bit, but it's too pointed, it didn't really work. What ended up working is one of these larger paper clips because it's got a flat bit on the end. They do make particular tools for depinning all different types of Molex connectors, but you can probably make it work with a paper clip or something similar. Before you take any of these out, make sure you take a couple of pictures of the back of this thing so you can put them back in in the right order. It took me forever to figure out how to get these things to release, but you're gonna stick something in this bottom hole right here. And eventually when you get it right, you will feel a little bit of a click or a snap and you should be able to pull these things out pretty easily. So I just got that one. Um, it's not a big click or anything, but eventually you will feel it kind of engage and then push in a little bit farther. Um, so just keep trying, eventually you'll get it and you'll get the feel for it and the rest of them will go a whole lot faster, but that's how you deep in these little things. So you'll take the end that you just depend, and I just wrapped some electrical tape around mine to help protect it. And I'm going to sneak it down inside here and follow this other wire. Um, and eventually it'll pop out down here by the footwell. It's probably easiest to help feed this wire through if you can pop this panel out, which is done by first removing this plate, the sill plate, which just pops right out. And then you can remove this piece, which goes in right there and just held in place by one plastic nut, which you gotta remove. And then there's two 10 millimeter bolts 
one lower left, one lower right, and then this whole piece just pops out. So here's my cable, and now I can just continue feeding this down. Um, we're gonna be aiming for the grommet uh, that goes to the firewall right by the emergency brake down here. The last step is pretty easy. Once I've got my cable routed, uh, I'll just plug it in to its matching end right here and then replace this E-pillar trim piece. All right, there's everything all buttoned up. I ain't mad at it. Pretty psyched about how this is gonna work. I think this will make it really easy to get in here, touch buttons, turn stuff on and off if I need to, and uh, be able to do it quickly, which is important. And it doesn't really stick out too far. The only thing I might change is if I was gonna do it again, I might have mounted this thing a little bit further back on the A-pillar. Um, it doesn't really stick out too bad. It's definitely not a problem, but I think uh, trying to get it maybe flush with this surface would help a little bit. But overall, pretty psyched about the wiring and how everything's set up. And it feels actually really sturdy in here. I could, I could punch it real fast if I had to and it's not gonna move. All right, now comes maybe the most challenging part of this whole operation. You have to route the communications cable through this grommet in the firewall. So here's a shot of it from inside the engine bay. You can see there's a big bundle of wires in the center, and then there's a smaller black wire with a blue cap on top. Those are both stock. The wire to the left that's wrapped in a little bit of electrical tape is a wire that I added that goes directly to my air compressor. Here's a shot of that same grommet, but this time it's from inside the cab. I think the best way to route the communications cable through this grommet is to utilize this little rubber nipple that's actually hidden underneath the main bundle of wires. You can see I'm kind of pushing it off to the side right here, but you wouldn't necessarily know it's there unless you got in there and felt around because it's really hard to see from inside the engine bay. I think it's easier to cut this thing off from inside the cab because there's just more room for your hands and more room for tools. Finally, to snake the communications cable through the new nipple hole you've created, wrap the end of the communications cable in electrical tape so you don't get any of the connectors messed up. And I also added a little bit of solid wire to the end to help guide this through the hole initially. I found that it really helped if you add a little bit of dish soap to the taped end of the communications cable to help it slide through the rubber. Once the communications wire is through the firewall, you can repin the Molex connector and make sure you take pictures or here's a little diagram that shows from the rear view. When these are fully seated, you will hear a small click, so be sure to listen for that. Once you have that small click, then you can reset this front part by pushing it back in. If you're gonna mount the power module to the bracket, these screws are included in the whole package and they also include some nuts with a little walking crush washer but since uh, SDHQ embedded these nuts within the mounting plate I'm just going to use these instead um, and then add a little bit of Loctite just to make sure that none of these things come loose accidentally. Here's the mounting location for the power module. You can see there's a little splash guard held in place by two plastic clips. You'll want to remove or cut away the splash guard and remove those two plastic clips. So here's a shot of that splash guard removed and then these are the two bolts, one here and one below, that we're going to use to mount the mounting bracket. SDHQ provides this mounting hardware. These two black clips have threads that are embedded in them and you just slide them over the holes in the body panel. It's definitely easier to remove the battery so it's a lot easier to get in here and tighten these bolts down. Having clean wiring is just part of my own OCD, but the communications cable is attached right there. And then I kind of paralleled some of this other existing wiring and zip tied it up. And then if you take off the lid of the fuse box, you can actually move it and push that cable in alongside of it. And that feeds directly back to the firewall grommet. So I think that works pretty well. It's pretty clean, keeps it out of the way. And when the battery and everything's in here, you can barely even see it. After the power module is mounted and the communications wire is routed, you can then plug in the 16 pin connector, which has all the wires um, that you'll connect to your accessories. One of the wires on the 16 pin connector is a black wire and that's your ground. 
It doesn't come wrapped like this, but I used some of the supplied plastic woven loom here and just cover this thing and put a little shrink wrap over the end just to make sure it's protected. This is a super critical wire and it has to be mounted to the negative terminal on the battery. And at the risk of becoming an SDHQ ad, um, if you pick up some of these aluminum billet battery terminals, there's a bunch of different mounting options on the back of them, which help keep all this stuff looking really clean. Um, and it's just a huge upgrade from what comes from the factory. So they're pretty sick. All right, both the wiring harnesses are connected to the Switch Pros. The bottom one with the green, white, red, and black wire is the communications wiring harness that goes to your control panel. This top one is the 16 pin connector and this is what all your accessories are gonna get wired to. All these colored wires coming out the top will go to accessories. The white, the pink, and the light blue wires that are coming out right here are not gonna to go to accessories. The blue wire is the power for this whole thing and that needs to be um, connected into a 12 volt circuit. I'm gonna tap into my ignition fuse for that. The pink and the white wire are both trigger wires, which can be configured to uh, turn on certain accessories when other inputs in the vehicle are turned on like your headlights. So with the light blue, pink, and white wire, I put those into their own plastic mesh loom here, put some uh, shrink wrap tubing over the end, and then I'm gonna feed it into the fuse box right here. A lot of people just run these cables right over the edge of the fuse box and shut the lid on top of them. That doesn't make any sense to me and it drives me nuts. So what I did is I drilled a hole in the side of the fuse box, put a little rubber grommet in there, um, and then fed my three wires inside their little plastic loom inside the fuse box into this empty slot right here. That way uh, these cables are protected. You're not shutting a lid on top of your cables because eventually that's gonna kink them and ruin them and it just makes for a nice clean install that keeps these things out of the way. So the light blue wire needs 12 volt power. And I'm gonna tap into the ignition, which is this 10 amp fuse. The white wire is a trigger for the backlighting to dim on the control panel when you turn the lights on. So for that, I'm gonna use a headlamp, which is this 15 amp fuse right here. The pink wire is another trigger wire, which I'm not gonna use for now. I might hook it up later. So I just tied it up, put a zip tie around it, and then poked it down into this empty slot right here. Okay, so blue wire goes to ignition, which is this 10 amp right here. The white wire is gonna to go to one of your low beams, either the right or the left, 15 amps right there. The kit from Switch Pros does come with a fuse tap, but it's a different type of fuse than what the third gen Tundras use. These use low profile fuses, which look like these. And in the picture, it shows a five amp fuse as the fuse that protects the new circuits that will go to the Switch Pros. So I loaded up both of these fuse taps with five amp fuses on top. The fuses that you take out and replace with the tap go into the lower slot, so the 10 for the ignition and then the 15 for the headlights. All right, the last step is to connect the power cable, which is this red one that goes into that stud right there in the Switch Pros unit. And then I ran mine down and around the side of the battery and it ends up over here. Again, this is the last thing you're gonna do after everything else is hooked up, make sure your ground is connected and uh, your two trigger wires are into the fuse box and then put that thing in and you're pretty much done. All right, so I wanna show you how to properly connect an accessory to the Switch Pros. So I'm gonna hook up some ditch lights and this is the wiring harness that came from Baja Designs. So this is where you'd normally connect it to your battery with a positive and a negative lead. This one has a fuse in it. Um, everything kind of comes in here to this relay. There's a switch that they provide. And then both these ends plug into the lights themselves. So with the Switch Pros, you definitely don't need all of this. You don't need the switch. You don't need a fuse that's you know, the relay that's all built into the SP9100 itself. I am going to use some parts of this just because the wiring's here and it's all kind of nicely wrapped. But I'm going to cut this up. And really all you need, I'm going to snip these things off kind of where they terminate here at the end. But all we need are the positive and the negative from each of these uh, wires that goes to each of the lights. So I just snipped off both of those wires and you can see there's a positive and a negative for each. I'm gonna join these two lights together because I want them to operate off the same switch and not different switches. So I'll uh, make a junction and join these together. The negative I will take to a frame ground and the positive end, the positive lead is gonna connect into the switch pros. 
So here's the two black negative wires coming from the ditch lights. I'm going to solder and then seal this joint and then I'll put a ring terminal on the end and connect it. So there's the junction all soldered together. A little bit of flux showing, but not too bad. So I'll put some heat shrink tubing over that and then tuck it away. All right, here's the joint with some heat shrink over the top. Since I'm joining two wires into one here, I use two different sizes of heat shrink tubing, a larger size over here and a smaller size over here, and then put a little section over the middle. Sometimes I double up on this stuff. It's probably overkill, uh, but it makes me feel good. And now it's a totally watertight and weatherproof connection. All right, so here's the black wire. This is our negative or the ground. So I put a ring terminal on this, and then for these ditch lights, which I'm running kind of underneath this plastic piece right here, it's very convenient just to ground it to uh, the frame ground right here, um, which is just adjacent to the battery. It's okay to ground your accessories on a body ground or a frame ground, um, but the switch pros unit itself has to be grounded to the negative terminal with the battery. So here's the two white wires coming from the ditch lights connected into basically the same wire. I just used some of the excess wire that I had left over from the wiring harness. So two into one right there. And then this one will get connected into these two wires from switch five on the switch pros. Um, so the instructions are for switch five. It's one of the 35 amp rated switches. You connect both of these two wires, which are both for switch five into the positive uh, for in this case it's the dish lights all right thanks for watching hopefully that was helpful if you have any questions you can put them in the comments below remember hit that dislike button and never subscribe to this channel